an introduction, I uh, added both my uh, Italian collaborator, Fabio Negrino, and my PhD student, Geneviève Potsi-Bouchard, as co-authors to uh, this paper, because as you'll see, a lot of the insights that we've been able to uh, glean from the approach that we've developed to looking at the lithics at uh, Riparo Bombrini and other sites in Liguria uh, have been the result of a very collaborative kind of framework that we've developed over the years. And uh, it kind of, in short, basically uh, the title Making It Work in uh, encapsulates what we've been able to uh, define here and that it is absolutely possible and productive to bridge uh, different approaches but there are some challenges that uh, come up when you try to do this. Some uh, challenges come with uh, ideas that when you approach uh, archaeology as a practice and lithic analysis uh, in particular, um, you may be confronted uh, with old world versus <coughs> new world paradigms. And this could be uh, sort of glossed over as the North American versus European tradition, but uh, I think that from uh, the sort of heated discussions about paradigms and uh, different perspectives across uh, different parts of the world, uh, we've kind of come to a perspective now that's encapsulated uh, in some of the papers that I'll talk to about in a minute, where there's actually more of uh, an effort to, to actively bridge these, these differences. Um, not everybody is necessarily on board. There are some papers that have sought to uh, trigger, uh, I guess, some more active or uh, explicit discussion of these issues. This paper by Mike Schott that came out in 2003 was very explicitly uh, combative in terms of confronting uh, the reduction sequence method that is more uh, in vogue in North America to the chaîne opératoire approach, which is more in vogue in Europe. And um, I think that in some ways, the style of this essay was uh, uh, part of why it hasn't generated quite as much discussion as uh, it may well um, uh, or should maybe have uh, over time. And in fact, this is one of the elements that uh, Tostevain uh, raised in his discussions in his 2011 paper that, to his knowledge, in 2011, there hadn't been any kind of explicit response from European scholars to um, the uh, charges of uh, Mike Schott. And um, there was sort of a question mark as to why, what was, what, why the case, what, why, what, <laughs> why that was the case. And um, this paper marks uh, an interesting inflection point, I think, in the evolution of uh, how we think about some of these contacts across traditions, uh, in that it was very explicitly focused on trying to find uh, common language, find common terminology, find uh, theoretical middle ground for people to productively uh, work across traditions and combine the best elements of North American versus European approaches. And, um, the question that uh, Tostame raised about uh, the challenges raised by Schott uh, was somewhat addressed in uh, two recent papers um, by Udouz and Carlin and by Catherine Perles, who uh, basically uh, confirmed what Tostame said. They didn't really talk about uh, Schott's uh, uh, attacks, I guess, uh, except to note in uh, Odu's and Calais paper that uh, Schott brought to their attention uh, an interesting case of refitting uh, in the early uh, or in the late 19th century, which had previously um, escaped the attention of uh, the majority of French uh, scholars. But by and large, I think that the combative style that was um, used in uh, some of the work of Schott and other people uh, was not necessarily conducive to dialogue and kind of belied the fact that a lot of people are collaborating across research traditions and arriving to uh, really interesting ways of uh, doing uh, productive and groundbreaking work in understanding how people in the past actually lived as filtered through their lithic uh, result. Now, another thing that comes out of a close reading of some of these papers is that there are still some tr traditional differences, I guess, between the two approaches with uh, the Chêne approach writ large still being somewhat 
uncomfortable with elements of quantification or overt uh, explicit efforts to quantify everything, which uh, is fairly dominant in a lot of North American approaches. And the notion of optimization, which uh, still uh, undergirds a lot of the thinking about how lithics were used in uh, North American traditions, uh, still creates a little bit of discomfort. And that's, that's okay. I, I think a little bit of discomfort is not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, it's important to not let it be a paralyzing force. Now, one of the things that's really uh, great about the chenepel approach, though, is that it does emphasize case-by-case -case variability in the lithic record. There are some norms that uh, seem to be agreed upon in terms of how people will make lithics, but there are a lot of contingent factors that will play into how this actually plays out. And this is what uh, a chenepel approach focused on lithics and focused especially on stages of production will be able to yield. There are some dimensions linked to the organization of technology in the sense of what uh, Peggy Nelson called it in 1991 that still uh, are not easily reconciled with uh, some of the tenets of the Chalet de Palatois. And this is sort of what I'm going to be focusing on today because I think that there's actually quite a bit of overlap here that can be, um, that can be uh, productively recruited to develop a finer grain understanding of how people lived in the past. And so when I started working in Italy a number of years now, um, uh, the main perspective was still heavily dominated by typology, not only typology, but the Laplace typology, which has its own uh, sort of bugaboos associated with it. But it had been changing, but people were still explicitly focusing on issues of the shape and the production of lithics as opposed to necessarily focusing more on how these lithics reflected adaptations to changing Context and climates and territories. There were, however, a lot of technomic, techno-economic interests that were explicit in how people were trying to understand raw material procurement, uh, raw material uh, usage uh, across sites and across territories. And there were also efforts at ex integrating elements of reduction sequences, life use, uh, life history. Uh, reduction intensity, uh, such as a uh, fairly uh, classic paper in Italy anyway, uh, on the end scraper reduction from Rotaro Manelli that Emilio Caribietti um, had uh, written in 2003. And I think that Emilio Caribietti, who uh, <coughs> passed away much too soon, uh, was really a very uh, important door that was opened onto the Italian world in order to uh, foster some collaboration with North American perspectives. We can think already of people like Steve Kuhn and Stefano Grimaldi in the 90s, but more recently people like Ansel Spina Poche, my collaborator Fabio Negrino, myself, uh, different people like that. And so the Bietti School, I think, was especially important in Italy to allow uh, people to collaborate in different perspectives. And so I'm going to give one uh, fairly detailed example of how we've managed to do this in the site of Riparo Bambrini, which is located in the Valzero Sea here. There's a number of other sites where we're working, or our team is working across Liguria, and I'm happy to talk about them individually with you uh, later on if you want so, uh, if you want to do so. I wanted to talk about that in the candidate, but uh, I didn't have enough time to squeeze it into this presentation, so I apologize for uh, shifting away from what the abstract had promised, uh, but it's, it's still good, so uh, just, <laughs> just bear with me. Um, so this is what uh, the Balsiro Sea looked like. It's a uh, cliffside here dotted with caves. On one side of this railway, you've got Riparo Mocchi. On the other side of the railway, you've got Riparo Bombrini. You can see it was probably still just a single uh, talus slope opening in front of uh, Grotta del Caviglione in between here, uh, back in the Pleistocene. And it was only truncated in the late 19th century when the Genova to Marseille uh, railway was, was built there, uh, thereby bringing to light some of these sites. Um, the site of Riparo Bombrini is especially interesting because it also comprises a late Mousterian and early proto Ignatian sequence. Uh, and so we have this fairly clear and fairly abrupt passage from one tradition to another tradition. People are making very different things, as you'll see in just a minute. And we've got a fairly extensive uh, data set uh, that's procured over a relatively large area uh, over the years, uh, first discovered in 1976 and excavated punctually in 2002, 2005, and then consecutively since 2015 under my direction and that of Fabio. And so um, you've got 
for the late Mysterian, a fairly classic discoid uh, Mysterian with lots of uh, pseudo Lavalla points that uh, indicate this type of reduction um, strategy that dominates at the site. Sometimes you've got a few Lavalla elements as well, but uh, by and large, this is the dominant uh, chaîne opératoire, very geared towards producing small flakes locally based raw material procured about five kilometers away from a uh, very poor quality uh, conglomerate of flints of various types uh, called Ichotti. In contrast, in the proto regnation you've got the dominance of blade blade based chaînes uh, opératoires um, focused almost exclusively on the production of these things, but a lot of the production debris includes flakes, uh, which were often recycled into splinter pieces. Uh, you've got some larger elements as well, some points, a few hand scrapers. Fairly classical stuff for the proto ignition. So two worlds in terms of what the lithic technology represents for the Mysterian and uh, the proto ignition. Our problem with this is that we saw it's different. Uh, you know, you didn't need a chaîne opératoire. You didn't need a reduction sequence perspective to really see this. The question is, how do you integrate this? And uh, this is. Uh, a question that uh, has really uh, been the sort of cornerstone of my work uh, since my PhD time, uh, and my, my colleague Martin Bar Michael Barton is here, and some of these ideas about how to actually compare assemblages across technotypological units uh, come from discussions that we've had over 20 years now. And so the key thing about stone tools, and I think everybody can agree on this, even if you're not keen on the idea of optimizing or maximizing utility, is that you know proportionally stone tools are pretty heavy. You have to make a trade-off if you're going to carry stone instead of carrying something else like food or water or offspring or what have you. Anybody who's done experimental work also knows that lithics just uh, use up are used up very quickly. You produce a lot of debitage uh, as you produce lithics themselves. I think that uh, Amy's presentation just before was a very good example of that. And because of these constraints, they are extremely necessary for people to trade them off against something else. And so you've got that emerges from these considerations, the notion of utility and quantity that we've managed to operationalize in a way to actually put uh, in functional terms and linked to issues of mobility. And this is just a quote that postdates some of this work that uh, we've done with Michael uh, by Steve Kuhn, but that encapsulates the idea very well. And so basically you have this general negative relationship between the amount of stuff, lithically speaking, that you'll find in an assemblage and the proportion of it that will be retouched. And this gives you a rough measure of how people are conceptualizing the stone tool assemblages that they're producing and how you then reconstruct from that land use and mobility strategies. And so you can, you can plot the amount of stuff that you've got here and the amount of utility that you want to um, maximize. And then you can conceptualize in the upper right hand uh, assemblages that are fairly curated. And in the lower right hand, assemblages that are lightly curated, lots of pieces, little pieces, uh, a few proportionally fewer retouch. And with this, you can extrapolate mobility strategies with, to refer to the Bifordian sense, uh, a more logistically based system here and a more uh, residentially based system up here. And the interesting thing is that once we, well, this is what it should look like when you put some numbers on it, and I refer to the paper that we published a number of years ago to uh, encode some of this stuff. But when you actually plot this out for Riparo Bambrini, you actually have in the proto ignition a distinct strategy relative to the Mysterian, but you have some variability within it as well. And even within the Mysterian itself, you have some variability. So within the general idea of uniformity of the chains of that are used to produce the lithic systems at, in both periods, you do have some variability which is interesting and uh, stimulating to think about when you incorporate into your interpretation of the record. And here I'm just going to focus on the proto-ignation uh, part of things. You've got uh, the distribution of um, various classes of artifacts uh, in the two proto ignition levels, level A1, which is at the top, and A2, which is at the bottom. And within that, you've got some slight differences in terms of the density, in terms of the amount of retouch, in terms of typological diversity, which is not simply uh, randomly distributed, but seems to correspond to different mobility strategies. And using that as a jumping board into expectations 
about how the site was used, you see in a two or more organized or clear use of space with clusters of debris being uh, accumulated in some marginal parts of the shelter, so a slightly different situation in A1. And for the funnel analysis, uh, you also see uh, burning and fragmentation and uh, management of funnel remains that patterns in slightly different ways that are uh, correspondent to this. We can also add to this a pattern of raw material exploitation that is interesting because at first glance, the proto-regnation is dominated by the exploitation of the same general sources of raw material. But once you look at it a little bit more, uh, in a little bit more fine-grained manner, you see that there are some differences between the earlier proto-regnation of the site, starting about 41,000 years ago, and the later phase of the proto-regnation with some links to central Italy being more dominant or evident in the earlier phase than in the later phase where the link to uh, the, south, the south of France is a little bit more pronounced here. And with um, the earlier phase, you also have examples of artifacts that have traveled from outcrops located close to Grotta di Fumane, uh, which indicate a slightly more broad uh, lithic system uh, that was used to uh, procure in raw material um, this site in uh, slightly different ways across the proto nation as well. And so you can link typology, technology, uh, techno-economy, mobility, and different things in order to get at the fact that you can get, uh, you know, a really fine-grained resolution on how these people were behaving. People were not just being proto regnation into proto regnation they're also doing things with their lithics. And so trying to figure out how these lithics were incorporated into an adaptive system is an important thing. And so we've really tried to put the emphasis on how our approaches can be complement complementary as opposed to uh, creating potential tensions. And we found that the most important way to make this work is really to kind of st always take a step back when we try to uh, approach or develop a plan for lithic analysis and avoid dogmatic positions. Uh, it also helps that we're both, uh, Fabio and I, relatively young in our career and don't really have uh, uh, a lot of uh, fiefdom, I guess, to, to protect in term of uh, our publication record. But uh, this, this helps also, and I I'm, I'm, might as well be explicit about this uh, because you know, moving away from this dogmatism is, is an important part as well. And so these hybrid perspectives, I think, can be highly uh, productive. We just need to foster uh, environments where they will be able to develop and uh, root themselves in order to lead to better uh, lithic analysis and better understanding of people in the past. Thank you.